QuickBooks Online 2024 Bank Feeds Matching Invoice to Bank Feed Deposit. Get ready and some coffee because we're off to a quick start with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online bank feed practice file we set up in a prior presentation. Opening the major financial statement reports as done every time. The report's on the left-hand side within the favorites. We're going to be right-clicking on that balance sheet report. Open link in a new tab. The same with the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement. And one more time for that trial balance, the good old TB. If you don't have that trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it. We're going to tab to the right close the ham buggy and then change the range. We're going from 010124 tab, 02924 tab, dropping down for the months so we can see them side by side and running it. Tab it to the right, repeat the process, close the hamburger, put the bun on the burger. And we're going from 010124 tab, 022924 tab, drop down. We want the months and run it to refresh it one more time. Uno, vase, mas, por favor. Changing the range in 010124 tab, 022924 tab. Drop down months and we will run to refresh once again. Let's go back to the balance sheet. This time we want to be thinking about a system where we have to invoice a client and how how is the bank feeds going to fit into that kind of system because we'll have to deviate from the straight cash-based system. So let's go into our desktop flowchart, which we're using for online purposes, just to look at the flow of the forms, looking at the customer cycle, revenue cycle, sales cycle, or income cycle, whatever you want to call it, noting that the flow of the cycle at the end of the day should result in cash going up for goods and services that we provide, but that flow will differ depending on industry. So the simplest thing we talked about before is like if you get paid by YouTube or something, you're a gig worker, they just deposit money into your account. That's great, it's beautiful, I love it. Then we just wait till it comes through, the deposit in the bank feeds, we record it as revenue. However, sometimes you might be at a cash register, in which case you might want an internal control to double check the money that you're receiving and not just wait till it clears the bank and therefore you might have to go through a clearing account which complicates the bank feeds we'll talk about that more in a future presentation or you might be uh in a situation where you have to invoice the client it's no it's no fun but I, that's what i've been in most of my life so that's what i have to do you've got like a cpa firm or a law firm you've got to do the work first invoice the client and then try to get the client to pay you after you did the work and then sent them the thing. So you want some trustworthy clients out there, which are not always easy to find these days. Trust is in rare supply, limited supply. So now we have to create the invoice. 
Now, if we create the invoice, what's going to happen? It's going to increase the accounts receivable. The other side is going to go to revenue, recognizing revenue when we enter the invoice. Then we're going to need to track the accounts receivable to try to collect on the receivable, noting that cash has not yet been affected. So, so that means there's no bank feeds in the process. The bank feeds can't record the invoice for me. And then when we receive the payment, then we could receive the payment and then put it possibly into a clearing account, which is how the system is kind of designed to work. And it works that way in the event that possibly we get multiple payments that we have to group together so that when we put them into the bank, they will match the same format that goes into the bank. Same rationale as if we're at a cash register, although at a cash register, this is more likely to be a problem. In other words, if we invoice someone and then we receive payment in cash, and we have multiple payments that we receive in cash, then if we record it on our side as a receipt of each cash transaction into the checking account, and then we go to the bank and deposit it into the bank as one lump sum, instead of five individual transactions, then our bank fee transaction, which will help us to reconcile, will not match. We'll have to combine together multiple uh, items to match what was deposited in the bank. If you find yourself doing that, then your flow system is probably not optimal. By the time we go to the bank feeds, it should either be easy to record the transaction or easy to match the transaction. If it's not easy, you probably need to adjust your system. Uh, so, or we could at this point in time, when we receive the payment, put it directly into the checking account. And that could work in systems where, for example, we're getting paid by electronic transfer. So if we invoice the client and then they pay us with electronic transfer or with a, just a check instead of like cash, for example, or a credit card, then it's going to directly go into our checking account at that same dollar amount. And therefore, that'll be fine because we don't have multiple transactions matching together and the bank feed will should be able to tie out to that transaction. So uh, the basic point here is there's, there's three steps to the, to the transaction possibly for an invoice. We make the invoice, we receive the payment, and then possibly we make the deposit if we're using the clearing account. And that means the bank feeds could feed into this at any of those points. I could make the invoice, increase in the accounts receivable, and then wait till uh, it clears the bank, like get paid. They pay us with an electronic transfer, for example, it clears the bank and then I try to tie that bank feed out to the invoice with the bank feeds or I create the invoice and then I receive the payment depositing it directly into the checking account and then I can use the bank feeds to tie in to basically this form which was used basically as a deposit or I could use this form to put it into undeposited funds and then I could try to connect the bank feeds to this form for undeposited funds to move it from undeposited or payments to deposit to the uh, checking account, or I could make the deposit myself and use the bank feed to tie out to the deposit. So let's look at each of these. Let's, let's first start off with an invoice and see what would happen if we tried to connect the bank feed to the invoice. So let me show you. We're gonna go back on over here and let's imagine that we're gonna create an invoice here. So I'm gonna say invoice, create an invoice. And let's say this is gonna be for uh, customer number five. So we, we already made the sale and we're gonna bill the client for it. Customer five, and we'll just set that up, boom. Let's actually put this in March 03, 01, uh, 24, so that we have a, a clean month that we can look at. So that, that's the invoice date. The due date we're saying is 30 days later based on the net 30 up top. And so we have tags, no tags. The product, we set up a product before with inventory items. So let's use that one because it'll be a little bit more complex. So I set up an inventory item and let's say we sell one of those. We sell them for 175, sales tax is applicable. And then I'm going to then say, okay, and then let's see if I can go into see the math here, see the math. And then I'd like to calculate based on my generic 5% that we set up 
just for generic problem purposes because you might not be in the same location that I set up here. So what's this going to do now? It's an invoice. It's going to increase the accounts receivable for the full amount, including the sales tax, 183.75. The other side's going to go to revenue for 175, not including the sales tax. The difference of sales tax is going to go to a payable account of the 875 and the inventory is going to be going down by an amount not shown here, but driven by the item of $100 in our case and the cost of goods sold. The expense for us selling the inventory is going to go up by the 100 The net impact on net income sales price, $175 minus the cost of goods sold, $100. And the subledger for the receivable will be impacted for customer number five. So we can try to collect on the receivable and the sub ledger for the inventory will be impacted because we're using a perpetual inventory system, decreasing not only the dollar amount, but also the unit. So let's go ahead and save and close it. So I'm gonna say save and close. Let's go to the, to, to the balance sheet, run it. Now we have something in accounts receivable. So if I go in, oh, actually let's, change the date I went up to February 03 31 to 4 run it so now in we had something activity in February in accounts receivable I, I'm sorry uh in March right so there's the 183.75 for the full amount including the sales tax back let's go back to the income statement the other side's on the income statement changing the range to 03 31 to 4 tab run it so there's the 175 that doesn't include the sales tax. The sales tax back on the balance sheet is down here, was included in this California tax, now up to 1780. The inventory is going to go down because we sold inventory and are using a perpetual inventory system by the $100. And the cost of goods sold over here on the income statement, $100 net impact on net income, $75 uh, from that transaction. Now let's imagine that our system is they pay us with electronic transfers, noting that you could set up electronic transfers basically uh, by, by having them in any format you want. But if you set up QuickBooks's checking account, set up their payment system, then when you send the invoice, you might have more options to you, the ability to have them pay you electronically. So if I go into this, for example, and look at this invoice and then go down here uh, you can see customer payment options so if you edit the payment options and you use quickbooks basically checking account then then you can have them pay you directly into like the quickbooks checking account which would be one format where you know the transaction is going to hit your checking account in the same dollar amount as you invoiced for and therefore you possibly could wait till it clears the bank and it might be a little bit faster for QuickBooks to kind of automate the process of matching up the payment that was received to the invoice uh, automatically. Otherwise, you could have them pay you in some other way. They might pay you in cash, which would complicate the system a little bit, pay you by credit card, which again could possibly complicate the system uh, a little bit because the credit card might batch the transactions in, in a certain fashion before they hit your checking account. And uh, so those things will, will make it a little bit more complicated sometimes. But let's first think about a situation where it's gonna deposit into our checking account in the same dollar amount that we charged here. So then if I go back to my bank feeds, first tab, go into my transactions, and I'm gonna say bank transactions, let's add one that we're gonna imagine is gonna, what would flow through the bank that we would see flow through the bank. I'm gonna say date and then amount and description, which I think I spelled right that time. And let's say that this happens, they're gonna pay us, when are they gonna pay us? Let's go back on over here and say it was on three, let's say three, three, they pay us. So on three, three, two, four, they pay us the amount, full amount that is due, including the sales tax of the 183.75 so 183.75 and description customer three uh payment and then bank jargon right <laughs> so i'll save that and then we're gonna say save as and let's make it a csv file save as a csv file 
so we can upload it to the bank feeds. So this is what we imagine would come through the bank feeds. Going back to the first tab and adding that upload from a file, upload the file, the new one, 440, which is the name of this presentation or the number of it. So you could find it. It's gonna go into the checking account if you just wanna use that for practice. Yes, one column, that's the format of the date, 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 description, description, amount, amount, MUI B to the N, BN. So that's an increase that looks good. Let's continue and say yes, boom, done. So, okay. So then if I look at that amount, when this comes through the bank feeds, so let's say we sent the invoice, we told them to pay us electronically on the invoice in some way, shape or form, either using you know QuickBooks checking or not, we might've told them to pay us electronically to our checking account, which we then connected to the bank feeds, which isn't through QuickBooks either way. Once it hits our, our QuickBooks, if the dollar amount is the same as the invoice, notice QuickBooks should see it. So now we're gonna say, okay, it matched it out. And when I record this, QuickBooks should record the rest of the transaction, uh, basically reducing the accounts receivable. So before I do that, let's first take a look at everything else that happened. If I go into this first tab, this accounts receivable, let's go to the tab to the right, right click and duplicate it and take a look at a sub ledger of the accounts receivable in the reports and then down in who owes you and we see the customer balance detail. Let's look at the customer balance detail as of all dates. Okay, so customer number three owes us, actually it's customer number five I did this for, 183. So this is breaking out the accounts receivable by who owes us the money, 2,383.75. If I go back to uh, uh, the balance sheet, 2383.75. If I track this internally, whenever we invoice, if I go to the first tab over here and we go into our sales transactions, which you might call your customer center, I can go into my all sales and I can track uh, the invoices. So here's the unbilled income. We want open invoices. So here's the invoices that we have not collected on yet. And if we have invoices, you're going to have to kind of follow up and collect and then try to get collected on them, right? And then we can also find that in the invoices tab, which is probably the place that you would go first uh, here. And we can look into the uh, unpaid invoices. There's our unpaid invoices. We can also take a look at it by customer. It's much more important to manage the customers. Uh, you're going to do more work here if you are invoicing because you have to track the invoices, open invoices. Here's customer number five and boom. So the next thing that we would expect to happen normally is we would receive a payment. When we receive the payment, if we recorded it on our side, we would go into receive payment and then we'd have customer number five. There's the invoice and we would record the receipt of the payment, which would then uh, we could deposit it into our checking account at this point, or we could put it into the payments to deposit again. If if we put it directly into our checking account, then we would only do that if we have a system where we're, we're, uh, the invoice is gonna match the deposit. In other words, we don't have that grouping problem like you might have with credit cards or cash payments. If it was an electronic transfer or a check, you could put it directly into the checking account. However, if you do deal with credit cards that batch, or cash payments or some kind of financial intermediary like a Stripe or something that messes up sometimes your, your system, then you probably don't wanna be switching back and forth from the checking account to, to undeposited funds. You probably want to then always use the payments to deposit so that you have the same system all the way through all of your, all of your transactions. Just, just a point here. But for now, we're gonna say, if I was to record that, it would record it on our side and then we can match it to the bank feeds. However, instead of doing that, we're gonna wait till it cleared the bank because they paid us with an electronic transfer. So that means the bank might, notif might see it before we do, right? So the bank is gonna see it hit the electronic transfer and we can then go into the bank feeds as we saw here and say, okay, 
uh, that's not the bank fees, that's my dashboard, and to the banking transactions and say, okay, it matched it. And did it match it correctly? It should be able to get it correct as long as the dollar amount matches up and the date is fairly close. And so when it records this, we suggest the invoice, it should record the transaction. So let's say if it wasn't right, we could find another match. I'm gonna go ahead and say match it. That will record the transaction. Let's go back into the hamburger and then go into the sales detail again. So now if I look at that customer number five and we go into it, now we have the payment, right? The received payment has been received. So, so if I look at the invoice now, I can see it's been paid in this information in this format. I can also edit the invoice to see it this way. And you can see it's marked off as paid in full. And then I can also see this way that it also has been deposited. So the, the deposit you can't see in this, in this screen, but you can see the link of the payment. So here's the payment that's been linked. If I edit the payment or view to edit, it created this form for us. And then it linked it to the invoice. So the invoice has now received the payment. It put the other side into the checking account directly. So it put it directly into the checking account. So let's go into the balance sheet and say, boom, run it in March. We have our uh, payment. So there it is. Now I'm going to change the date here and say this, let's go from one over. So, so I, the thing I want to point out here is that you see an increase this time with a payment form, which is a little bit confusing, not too bad, but notice usually the increases are deposit forms. So, so if you're going to, 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 this is the, the flow chart. If you're going to record at the receipt payment point, an increase to the checking account, instead of going from received payment into the undeposited funds and then a deposit, then you have to remember that when you sort your detail in here, the transaction type for increases will be the payment forms as well as deposits. So when you filter, possibly filtering like this, if I want to see all the increases, I'd have to say add the transaction type and then I want it to be equals or not equal. This is equals. And then I have to pick up the deposits and the payments and possibly transfers, right? Transfers might be there as well. And so, okay, close that out. And so now I have the increases. So not a big deal, but the, the fact that you have more variance in the transaction type, which is often a key sorting field, is just something I want to uh, point out there. So there it is. So that works pretty good. Again, if you have a system where they're paying you with electronic transfers. Now, if you have a system where they're paying you with cash or they're paying you with credit cards, or it's going through some financial intermediary like a Stripe or a PayPal or something, then you might not be able to do that because, because you won't be able to match up the amount that clears the bank with the invoice. Why? Because the, it'll be different because the credit card company is going to batch multiple payments together. It's going to hit your credit. It's going to hit your checking account uh, over here on the bank feeds in one lump sum, which will be which will be a combination of multiple invoices or payments that you've received. So then you'll if you try to do that, you'll have to match up to multiple transactions that are invoices to one deposit that gets messy. You don't want to do that. It's easier. It's better to come up with some kind of system where you are utilizing the undeposited funds account. And so that you can actually figure that out on the accounting side of things, not when you're doing basically the bank feeds or reconciliation side of things. So we'll talk more about uh, that in future presentations. But for now, let's take a look at the trial balance. This is where we stand at this point. If you're following along, uh, you don't have to follow on really exactly with what we're doing with this practice problem. But if you are, this is that would be the best. <laughs> so uh, here's where we stand at this point in time. I'll go up to, to March. So we've included March. So this is our information. If, if your information ties out to this, if great, if not, then it might be a date issue. You could change the date range and, uh, and then drill down to the source document and change the date of the source document.